When the Buddha defines right resolve, he defines it in three terms. Resolve for renunciation, resolve for non-ill will, and resolve for harmlessness. Now the first one is obviously different from the other two. But the question often comes up, how are the other two different from each other? If you have ill will for someone, it's very close to wanting to see them harmed, wanting to do them harm. And there actually is a close relationship, but there is a distinction. Ill will is the opposite of goodwill. Harmfulness is the opposite of compassion. Goodwill is a general wish for happiness, for your own happiness and for others. Compassion is what you feel when you have goodwill for someone else, but you see that they're suffering or they're acting on the causes that will lead to suffering. They're doing things that will lead to suffering. And again, this can apply to yourself as well as to other people. Harmfulness is when you see somebody's down and you want to harm them. In other words, they're suffering, they're poor, in the position of weakness, and you want to take advantage of that weakness. That's what harmfulness is. So when we resolve on harmlessness, we don't pile on other people. And the same thing we don't pile on ourselves. Sometimes when We're feeling weak in the practice. Part of the mind will jump on us and say, it's a sign that you should give up. You can start telling yourself all kinds of stories about how meditation is not going well, even, even not giving up entirely, but just saying giving up for tonight. You sit down, your mind is all over the place, and you tell yourself, gee, I shouldn't be meditating, my mind is a mess. That's harmfulness right there, that thought. And as Jean Lee once said, if you can do harm to your own goodness, you, it's very easy to let it spread out and start thinking about doing harm to other people's goodness, too. It's interesting that when the Buddha talks about benefiting others and harming them, it's not a question so much of what you do to them, it's what you get them to do that's going to make the difference between benefit and harm. If you get people to observe the precepts, that's for their benefit. If you try to dissuade them from practicing, if you try to tell them that the precepts don't have to be held to all the time, or there are times when it's justified to kill or to lie or whatever, that's doing harm to those people. You've got them in a position of, you find them in a position of doubt or weakness, and then you take advantage of that. So when we practice on right resolve, we start first by learning how to appreciate our own desire for happiness, and doing what we can not to harm that. We learn how to encourage ourselves, how to give ourselves the morale we need in order to practice. And being resolved on harmlessness is, for other people, means that you try to encourage them too, whenever is appropriate. Now, there are a lot of times that people will not want to take your your advice, in which case John Lee would say that if you continue to try to give them advice, it's a form of idle chatter. But if you can see that either through advice or through example you can be a good influence on others, that's carrying out right resolve. Because the whole function of right resolve is to remind yourself that knowing about the Four Noble Truths, knowing about the teachings on karma is not enough. These are types of knowledge that demand action. They point out possibilities and they also point out dangers. In other words, the possibilities of training your mind, developing your goodness the dangers of not developing your goodness. And so Right Resolve acts on that knowledge and realizing that it's meant to be a guide. 
So try to develop goodwill for yourself and encouraging yourself to practice. And especially when you're down, this is when harmlessness comes in. You don't jump on the weakness or the discouragement or the times when you have an off night to pull yourself further away from the path. Even if you find you have other responsibilities that don't allow you to be practicing all the time. You don't use that as an excuse not to practice. You try to find the little cracks in the time of the day, the openings when you get the mind to settle down. Give yourself meditation breaks here and there. And you find that once you've taken a break like that and then you anticipate the next one, there's a possibility that you can make a link between the two. In other words, you're with the breath all the time as you're grounding. I received a phone call this evening from someone who said, how do I stick with the breath throughout the day? Do I just not care about other people? Do I not take in what they're saying? I said, no, that's not the case at all. When you're with the breath, you're giving yourself a solid place to stand as you take on your other responsibilities. In other words, you look for whatever opportunity there is to practice. There's a common phrase that you try to bring your practice into your life. Actually, it's the other way around. You try to bring your life into the practice. Now, there are in other words, the practice is the container. Your awareness of the breath should be the container for the day. And even when you can't focus entirely on the breath, give it your 100% attention, you can still make it the framework. Even though you're aware of what's going on, you're responding to what's going on outside. You can still be aware of the breath energy in the body. Maybe too much to ask to be conscious of in and out in the breath, but just the general quality of the breath energy is something you can sense immediately and deal with immediately, especially if you've been working in your formal meditation on how to breathe through tension in the body, breathe through blockages in the body, expand your awareness, expand the sense of the breath throughout the body. As you get better and better at that, it doesn't take all that much to bring that skill into the rest of your life. And if you do it well, you find that, yes, it is a grounding. It does provide you with a good foundation. So your breath is the container of the rest of your life, as it should be. After all, without the breath you wouldn't be dealing with anything at all, doing anything at all, having any contact with the outside world at all. You'd be dead. So spread your awareness around. Enlarge your awareness. Enlarge your sense of what you can do. And this is how you have goodwill for yourself. This is how you have compassion for yourself. It's that you hold yourself to a higher standard, realizing that you have these potentials. If you deny the potentials or you put them down, okay, that's acting in a harmful way to yourself. So it's an important part of the path that you learn how to keep yourself encouraged, that you have the morale to stick with the path, to stick with the practice, even when it gets difficult, even when you seem to be backsliding in terms of the results. Make sure at least that the causes don't backslide. Because after all, the mind is a complex phenomenon. There's not just one mind there, there are many minds. with lots of different agendas, lots of different attitudes. Sometimes you can deal with one mind in there, and everything seems to calm down, and tomorrow oh, another one comes up. And it's not that you've been defeated by the first one, it's just that you, you did take care of the first one, but another one has come. It's like a large organization, a big bureaucracy or a big corporation. And everybody's fire, firing emails at one another all the time. And 
you can take care of some of the unskillful emails from some quarters. And that seems to calm things down, but then tomorrow another faction will come up with theirs. Well, don't be surprised. Don't get discouraged. It's going to take a while to clean out the whole corporate culture inside here. So when you think about the principles of non-ill will and harmlessness, remember that you should be the beneficiary of them as well as other people. You don't want to harm yourself. Again, keep that point from a John Lee in mind. If you harm your own goodness, it's very easy to harm other people. So maintain your goodness. Regard it as your most precious possession. The Buddha talks about it. protecting your goodwill as a mother would protect her only child. Well, try to protect all your goodness in that way, because it's all you got. 